Okay. Good, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's try again. Yeah. Good, good morning, everybody. I guess it's time to start. So this is the year that ICES is launching its strategic initiative on the human dimension. So I think it's very appropriate that um, today's uh, keynote speaker is the Canada Research Chair for Natural Resource Sustainability and Community Development. Um, she also heads the uh, global partnership for small-scale fisheries research called Too Big to Ignore. So I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Ratana Choinpagdi. Thank you, Graham. Thank you for rehearsing my name too, so well and for remembering my long title. Sorry about that. But that is just to show, right, the kind of complexity we deal with when you wanted to have an interdisciplinary research chair, what you're going to call that. You have to call it everything. So that's, that's what happens. So I would like to first thank ISIS uh, for inviting me to do this plenary uh, presentation. That speaks volume of what ISIS is about, I believe, especially your commitment to provide the best science to policy and decision-making process. And I assume that because I'm standing here, you are referring to the two types of science at least, the natural and the social science. And you have seen a lot of that examples throughout the conference as well. The presentation by uh, Dave Seiko the other day was a fantastic illustration of that with music and science. Um, so I appreciate that not everyone would be familiar with some of the concept and the theory and the terminology that we use. But um, you might want to remember a few things. For instance, again, from Dave's talk on Tuesday, you heard the word population, community, migration. We use those terms as well. But when we do that, we mean people. Fishing people, fishermen, lots of people involved in those fisheries, not just fish. So if you just remember that, when I use those terms, then we'll, we'll be just fine. So my talk today would be about the project that I'm directing with a lot of colleagues in this room that is part of the project. So it is, um, it's quite a journey for us because we wanted to make sure that some, some, something is not right when we look at fisheries because for a long time we have been paying a lot of attention to fisheries as if they are one and the same. So what we are doing in this project is about making sure that we don't forget that fisheries are very diverse and, that, and there's a lot of complexity around this sector. The important that we wanted to emphasize in our work is to really highlight what we need to pay attention to this sector when we're trying to manage and govern the fisheries. So I'd like to just share with you some of those uh, findings, research that we have been doing in this project. So it was working when I tried this morning, and now it doesn't want to work. It's not moving. Thank you. Okay, so for the most part, it, is, it should start from something like this. Let's look at the big picture. People always find it surprising when I started to put in this kind of number, and I, I am too was caught by surprise when I see that we're talking about quite a large population of people here. 
they're not directly fishing people, but people who are really depend on fisheries and rely on fishing as part of their livelihoods and food security, whether directly or indirectly. So it's a big, uh, it's a large number. And then of those people that are involved in fisheries directly, 90% are small scale. So when you take a look at, when you think about that number, you have to wonder, do we see them? Where are these people? <coughs> And to think about the, the majority of them maybe not in where we are right now or part of the ISIS community, most of them are in Asia. But there's a lot of women involved in that activities as well. The problem that we have uh, recognized with looking at this particular sector is that for the most part they are quite marginalized and very vulnerable to a lot of changes that we see especially as we're trying to manage our fisheries as if they're one and the same, we end up causing a, a quite a, a negative consequences on the small-scale fishery sector. Just wanted to make sure that we really understand what's going on here and try to look at this sector. I know that we don't deal with inland fisheries around here, but they're quite, it's a quite a good proportion of the small-scale fisheries take place in inland waters but even in, in marine system as well. So this kind of number, this kind of figure suggests to us that they really are too big to ignore. What we are trying to illustrate with our project is that they're also too important to fail, meaning that we have to do a good job at governing this sector in order to really make it viable, make sure that they're sustainable. I wanted to take you a little bit on a journey simply because a lot of the time when people don't really pay attention to this sector, it's a lot to do with the fact that we don't really see them. And we may be thinking of them in a way that we're not too familiar with. We think that they need a boat, but you will see in these illustrations that sometimes fishing can just be gleaning from the beaches. There's a lot of fishing that takes place in many parts of the world. This is not just in developing countries or in the south, but they're also around here. So small-scale fisheries also take place in, 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 the, in the northern countries, in Europe and in North America and in um, and other you know, developed countries of the world. It's usually a men's world, but then, of course, we, all, we would argue that women also take important part in this process, not just uh, post-harvest as we think, but also for fishing. So there's a part of that way of life that people do, and they do that you know, through generations of people, people working together as part of the family activities, and they have a lot of connection and attachment to the place and the pride in their livelihoods. So those are some of the things that we really need to recognize. And those situations and the conditions that they face sometimes really are about how to survive in that context. But there's a lot of, uh, of joy and pride that people do in their, in their livelihoods. We know that fishing is not just about fishing, but it's a lot to do with things that have happened after, including the post-harvest activities. It could be as simple as taking fish out of the net, or a lot of market at the landing site is very, you know, probably the most exciting place to be, with a lot of people trying to do different things, using their, their catches in different ways, and trying to market it differently through different channels. So the small-scale fisheries uh, marketing channel is also quite different from the large-scale fisheries channel. But as you have seen, there's a lot of women, a lot of uh, people involved in different processes, and, um, and it's not moving. <laughs> OK. So, and then in the day in the life of a fisherman and a fisherwoman, you would also see that it usually end up with something like, you know, fixing the gear, mending the net, and just getting ready for the next day. So in many ways, this mosaic of life, it's sort of gelled together in a way that produce a very fantastic color and life and stories about fisheries and the fishing people that unless you go to those places, you don't really appreciate. And I have an opportunity to go to many of those places and, and, and witness what it means for fishing people to be doing, going about their livelihoods, just like what we do as scientists as well. 
So our job really is to make sure that they are able to maintain that viable livelihood and also being having a security in their, in, in their job and be able to make the contribution that they have been doing in terms of food security and also environmental stewardship. What I would like to do in the next part of my talk is a lot about how we have been doing this in various, uh, various efforts that have taken place to, to, to support this sector and also in fisheries in general. In the work that uh, we have been doing in the research that we're doing with the Fisheries Governance Network, we have identified four concerns in fisheries. This is not just small-scale fisheries, but in global fisheries. It's a lot to do with ecosystem health, social justice, livelihoods, and food security. This kind of concern basically sum up in the paper that I wrote with my colleague. Um, this is actually not the right presentation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the one that I replaced was not the one here. Um, the fisheries governance uh, as a wicked problem paper, is the, the concept of wicked problem is actually based on um, the paper that Ritter and Weber wrote in 1973 on planning theory. So, talking about the dilemma in the planning theory, and that's how uh, my colleague um, Sven Yentov and I wrote a paper situating that uh, same kind of dilemma in the context of fisheries governance. So, we have been um, very, uh, you know, very uh, trying to elaborate a little bit about these kind of concerns that we face and the kind of challenges that we, 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 we face as we are trying to address these concerns in the context of governance. So what have we done in the ecosystem health uh, aspect? Are we going to try to do anything about this or are we going to continue? Okay. Okay. Sure. Sorry about this. It's a wicked problem trying to give a talk when there's like four different machines going on. And, uh, but I, I, I actually, it was my fault actually. They asked me for this talk since like, you know, last week or something. But uh, <laughs> I don't know that you have the same habit that I do or not because, you know, usually. <laughs> My talk is ready when I'm ready to talk. So, <laughs> so having to do this way in advance was sort of a, a bit of a challenge. That's okay. It was a little bit too long. That's why I need to trim it and I sort of... Let me, let me just go there. You just mute my mic for a minute.
Okay, that was your coffee break for this morning. <laughs> See, now I have that Ritter and Weber's um, reference in there. Okay, so what we have been, what I'm going to do next is to talk about these different uh, concepts, the challenges and the concerns that we face in small-scale fisheries, and also in, uh, you know, similar actually in some ways to large-scale fisheries. But there are some certain contexts that you would see that is quite specific to small-scale fisheries. So when it comes to ecosystem health, we have been doing quite a good job, I would say, at uh, modernize, uh, well, develop the gear technology so that we can um, mitigate this impact in terms of habitat bycatch and discards. There's a lot also conservation efforts that we put, and particularly the marine protected areas. But this is one thing that would differentiate large-scale fisheries from small-scale fisheries. There's a lot of conservation efforts that are done in small-scale fisheries that are not usually accounted for when we think about these stewardship initiatives. So it turns out, of course, that MPAs, for the most part, actually do not always uh, align well with these kind of uh, practices that are happening in small-scale fisheries. And many people who promote MPAs might feel that we basically need to restrict the use and the access of uh, small-scale fisheries. So that creates a lot of problem. What we can do more, of course, is to try to bring those uh, two groups together and try to talk about how best to go about implementing or, or even designing and, and, and allocating these areas. And then the efforts that go into addressing illegal, underreported, and unregulated uh, fishing is also quite uh, prominent in, in, in the way we're trying to address and, and, and uh, ecosystem health. But again, this is something that we need to look closely at when we think about small-scale fisheries, because some may argue that a lot of those data about all the uh, catches in small-scale fisheries are actually underreported. They are not really included. So how to go about rectifying that is our challenge. When it comes to social justice, this is when things become really, really clear for people who are trying to study small-scale fisheries to recognize that there's a lot of effort that being um, in, about involving small-scale fisheries and other kind of fishers to participate in the management and decision-making, but yet there's still a lot that needs to be done. Fishers around the world become a lot more organized, and they actually started to make the kind of demand to ask the government to pay attention to, to their concerns, and I think that is becoming, we are hearing that more and more, and it's becoming quite effective. I just wanted to note these examples of institutional reform that is now taking place as well in places like South Africa and Cambodia, those places were, uh, used to have fishing basically dominated by large-scale commercial uh, sector. And now through that reform process, there is a transfer of ownership and reallocation of rights to small-scale fisheries. So that is a really, really good sign of where things are going in the right direction for small-scale fisheries <coughs> when it comes to addressing this social justice concern. Just wanted to uh, present this example of uh, the case here that you probably may be familiar with. This is a group called the Low Impact, um, Low Impact Fisheries of Europe. Sorry about that. It's called LIFE. I just remember that as LIFE. So basically, there's a very nice way to talk about how the organizations basically is run by fishermen and for fishermen. And this kind of demand that they're making to about, you know, they're making quite a strong statement uh, to, uh, with respect to the new common fisheries policy asking for the governments basically to pay attention to their need to maintain that livelihoods and their uh, contribution to sustainability because of their low impact fishing practices. Uh, livelihoods and well-being, like I said, is another concern that we face in small-scale fisheries and most, mainly in small-scale fisheries, and not just in the south, but also in the north. And this is basically because we have gone into this uh, direction we're trying to make small-scale fishing people specialized in fishing, forgetting that there's a lot of diversified portfolio that is part of that livelihoods. So when people are thinking about alternative livelihood options, Options. Sometimes it means taking people out of their fishing and going to do something that they're not comfortable with, 
or trying to reduce that opportunities to really have that viable livelihoods. So we need to do a lot more in thinking about that. And again, there are efforts around the world that are looking at this now. The example, especially, is sort of modeled after the agriculture system. The community-supported agriculture has been uh, around for a long time. And now we have the community-supported fisheries. Then, then the way they name this is always very interesting. A program like Off the Hook in Nova Scotia. Sea to fork and boat to table. Those are just a few names that I know. And I know that in, in, in Europe, there's a lot of um, also a lot of efforts in the same direction, especially with the direct fish sale. This is something that I came to realize the difficulty of this or some of the regulations that are making fishermen uh, the ability to sell fish very difficult in some places. I mean, in a place like Newfoundland you would think that people should be able to get fish quite easily. Well, it turns out that the provincial regulations actually don't allow fishermen to sell directly to consumers. So there's reasons for that, but at the same time, you know, it might be in the past because of the need to provide jobs to fish processing uh, workers and also this kind of uh, concern about health and safety and et cetera. And maybe they didn't think that there would be any consumers that are looking to buy those fish. But things are changing now. So we're also trying to engage with the provincial government to think about what we can do to enable, um, enable uh, small-scale fisheries to sell fish directly to consumer or through some kind of market cooperative. So that's something that we like to learn a lot from what's happening here in Europe. And we might need to brand the fish in Newfoundland. When we started the project, we actually put in our proposal this too big to ignore project we put in our proposal that most of the time when people hear well about um, Newfoundland fisheries, they think about cod collapse. So we wanted to change that narrative and have people think about the viability of small boat fisheries in Newfoundland. I might be naive, but uh, that's what we are trying to do. Uh, food security is definitely a major, major concern around the world. If you look at this uh, graph that shows the dimension of food security, comparing uh, from the 1990s to the 2000, you know, in the 2012, 2014, we actually have done better in terms of uh, make sure that there's availability of fish, that is quantity, quality, and also the accessibility and the stability, meaning that you can count on having food. But uh, utilization is a little bit, um, you know, more work to be done on that regard, and simply because a lot of time fish is being, uh, sorry, food is being used. This is not just about fish, sorry, this is about food security in overall. But food is not being utilized in a way that could, in, you know, improve health. Basically, it's the opposite. We have a lot of problem with obesity and other health-related issues, and also a lot of waste. So a lot more work to be done, especially when it comes to food security in developing countries' uh, context. But we do have a major instrument, which is FAO, uh, that is in, uh, basically spearheaded by FAO, but it is really a small-scale fisheries guidelines for the fishing people of the world. These new guidelines was endorsed in 2014 at the last uh, com uh, Community on Fisheries um, meeting, the COFI. So it was quite a process to get these guidelines uh, going. And uh, there's a lot of things in those guidelines that are quite different from what we have seen before. You know, for a long time, since 1990s, we have this uh, code of conduct for responsible fisheries. So in 2014, we have something that is quite specific for the small-scale fisheries. And the most important thing about the two, two important points about these guidelines. First, it's actually initiated by the civil society organizations. So they are the ones that went to talk with FAO about how we need to have these guidelines and basically organized this meeting in conjunction with FAO in Bangkok in 2008 to start thinking about how we need to have something that is not just a code of conduct, but basically a code of conduct for small-scale fisheries. So it's been an ongoing, long process, took a couple of years, really, through that consultation and negotiation, but now we have those guidelines. 
The other second point that is important about these guidelines is that it's actually based on human rights, which is quite a remarkable achievement when you think about uh, what we can do for small-scale fisheries. But that also makes it quite difficult as well to think about how to implement these guidelines. A couple of things that those guidelines say that really speak to how we need to put a lot of emphasis on the current and the future generations of fish, uh, fisheries and fishing people and their families. The emphasis on small-scale fisheries, uh, fishers and fish workers and related activities. And here again, we see that it is recognized that this is the group that have been mostly marginalized and they're vulnerable to lots of different kind of changes that we see around us. And, and also vulnerable to the policies that we make that actually have impact on their livelihoods. Okay, so for scientific community, we also have a lot of opportunities to enjoy these efforts about trying to improve the sustainability of fisheries to conference like we have here. So this is one of those conferences that really speak to uh, a lot of natural scientists, but also there's a lot of uh, social scientists in this conference as well. And we see the same thing now with the social science conference, like the People and the Sea. That is a conference that meet every other year. This past uh, conference in particular, there were a lot of uh, uh, natural scientists in that conference. One conference, however, that I started to look at and, start and wonder what, uh, what is going on in that conference is the World Fisheries Congress. So since, since it started, um, well, this is the seventh one that is happening in Korea next year. And you can see that they still talk about sustain sustainable fisheries, but if you were to look at the conference themes, you would learn that there's still a lot to do with large-scale industrialized and development and the technology which is quite different from the World Small Scale Fisheries Congress, which is the Congress uh, series that we started in 2010 in Bangkok, and we just had the last one in Mexico, uh, the, the, you know, the second one in Mexico last year. So you can see that there's a lot of differences between the way we talk about fisheries when you go to the World Fisheries Congress and when you go to the World Small Scale Fisheries Congress. This is something that we, we really need to uh, think about a little bit in terms of what we do. Again, for the scientific community and also from the funding communities, we know that there's a lot of funding that, uh, or, or budget and, and proposal that are being um, issued in order to support this kind of research on small-scale fisheries. This is the case here with the new uh, common fisheries policy supporting this kind of proposal, mentioned life group uh, quite explicitly in this particular call. In Canada also, this is how we get the support to do the partnership, this global network that we have. The Too Big To Ignore is supported by Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So it's a very large amount of money being given to Social Science Research Network, which is quite remarkable compared to what we have seen in the past. So it's a lot of ask that we have to do and a lot of deliverables that we have to make but this is something that we feel as a, as a movement moving into the right direction with, res, with respect to um, support that we get from the research communities to trying to do what we think is important to do. Um, the members of To Big To Ignore include about 200 people in 45 countries and with partnership with 15 organizations. That might sound like a big project, but when you think about that, 200 scientists for about 500 million people, uh, fishing people. That's like, I don't know, one to 2.5 million or something like that, which is not enough. So basically we need a lot more people to be engaged in this kind of network to help us along and really trying to understand the kind of issues and, and challenges that is facing uh, small scale fisheries. So our mission is pretty straightforward. We wanted to elevate the profile, recognizing that unless we know more about this sector, we will not be able to speak about them in the way that would demand attention. And then, of course, this marginalization, we have to do research and take whatever actions and activities that could support the small-scale fishing people when they're trying to argue for against that marginalization, and, and both in national and international policies. 
But our job really is to conduct research and build capacity and influence policy to address global food security and sustainability challenges that is facing fisheries around the world. So we are trying to do that in many, many ways. So I'm just going to speak to you, introduce to you some of the things that we have been doing. And it's related to this kind of intervention that we are trying to do. The reason for intervention is about how, how to create opportunities for small-scale fisheries by doing the same thing. How to deal with these challenges if they are wicked problems. So you need to bring in creative thinking and think about this quite differently in the way we go about our business. So we have to be innovative, and this speaks to at least three things in, in of information, in the way we collect data, in research and training, and also in governance. So when I started my talk, I presented this array of life and diversity and fishing people that take place in small places, in anywhere, in rural setting, in urban setting, in about anywhere there's aquatic uh, body, uh, you know, there's water, water body. So what it means is that the kind of collection, data collection information system that we have, that we can use and apply that, to large-scale fisheries are not going to be applicable to this sector. You can't really put this vessel monitoring system in all those little boats that we have or you know, in the back of, of, uh, of, of fish harvester that are just cleaning ashore. So how to do that? And then to decide what kind of data that is really important to capture. It is only about the number of people on the, what the catches, or actually it's everything else that is about this particular sector. So what we want, to, uh, you know, uh, applying the kind of criteria to decide what kind of data is important is really the very uh, challenging step for us. One thing we know for sure is that we can't really rely on a traditional way of going about developing this information system. Basically, what we need is what we use and we create for this information system on small-scale fisheries. It's a crowdsourcing platform. So basically, we rely a lot on existing data as well as people to help create this information system. And there's a lot of back and forth between the system and the people. We, we need to make this um, interface for the collection uh, information system as easy to navigate and as appealing and as attractive as possible. So we have a lot of design principles that go into what to do. So it's been two years in testing this interface with the use, uh, end users, including fishers, practitioners, and community groups around the world. So it is still a web-based, uh, it's an online open access, but still web-based. So the next step that we want to do is actually to try to make that as part of the mobile application. So if you're interested in helping us with that, you're most welcome to. Basically, that's a, that's, a, that's a thing that we think we would be able to get more of that data into the system. But it's been, uh, it's been working quite well for, uh, to a certain extent. The couple of, couple of the layers that we have that we started with is actually about the researchers, because we believe that you know, that would be the first group of people who would be interested in providing data to our system. So who's who is about researchers involved in small-scale fisheries. But now we're actually expanding that who's who to people involved in any aspect of small-scale fisheries, including fishing and organizations and, and groups as well. The state of the art is a lot to do with research that's been conducted in small-scale fisheries. And then we have a layer that is about small-scale fisheries profile, and that is the one that actually would contain the different characteristics about small-scale fisheries, uh, fisheries that would allow us to make comparison uh, once we have the data in the system. We're also interested in knowing about organizations around the world and then the capacity needs that people have. And then we have another layer that is about small-scale fisheries guidelines. I already mentioned about those guidelines, and this is basically a way to track the implementation of the guidelines to see what groups uh, around the world that are really talking about this and what each group and government are doing in order to implement the guidelines. So that's part of the research that we're doing. 
You can view these as a table, so you can see that there are people that you might know in this room that is part of this contribution to the, to the uh, ISSF, this information system in small-scale fisheries. So there's about 400 uh, scientists in, uh, in part of the, as part of this, but we're still missing a lot. So if you're not in that system yet, uh, you know, by all means, uh, please go to the system and, 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 and enter your data. You can also have map views, so you can start to you know, drill down, zoom out, do the thing that people do with maps, so that you can learn a lot more about what's going on uh, in these different places in terms of the kind of research, the kind of uh, characteristics of the fisheries, and, and the issues that, that people face in their fishing uh, life. So crowdsourcing actually means that we need your contribution. So again, if you're interested in signing up and make this contribution, let us know about your work. Let us know about the fisheries that you work with. So please go to the website and sign up. Perhaps I need to give you a little bit more information about what you can do once we have the data. So this is an example of what we can do when we have this kind of information. Imagine that we can do this kind of snapshot of the state of the art in small-scale fisheries research across the region. So we did this one for Europe as an illustration of what you can do once you have that kind of information in the system. So again, you know, you can kind of learn about what's else happening in Europe, who's doing what, what kind of topics, what kind of species, what kind of uh, issues that small-scale fisheries face. So be able to do that across the region and for each country, if you get that kind of richness in the data, would be wonderful. The Sea Around Us project based at the University of British Columbia in uh, Vancouver, you know that they have been doing this cash reconstruction uh, for the, uh, of the countries around the world. Just last week, they released this catch reconstruction that would in, that include uh, small scale fisheries. So they put they, they differentiate catches between the industrial fisheries with artisanal, with subsistence, and recreational. So we can now use that kind of data because uh, Sea Around Us project is actually partnered with uh, with TBTI. So we are able to share that data set and look at the kind of um, catches of small-scale fisheries around the world. And I'm comparing this in this particular map, we are comparing that with the Human Development Index. So you can see that in areas where you have high Human Development Index, there are some parts that you have a bit less in terms of small-scale fisheries, but there are some parts that you have high human development index and also high concentration of small-scale fisheries in comparison to large-scale. So that kind of data is very exciting to us to see. And again, this is just a global overview, which we can go back into each country and look more carefully at. You can also play with a little bit of what we call here complexity pyramid, if you like, to start to look at for countries that, that, uh, that have fisheries, uh, small-scale fisheries, what kind of ecosystem types that these fisheries take place and what kind of species that they get and started to appreciate a little bit more about the kind of relationship or not that is happening within this, between ecosystem and species. This is not representing the country directly because the the profile that we capture, some of them represent the country, some of them are just for the location. But that just to give you a flavor about what kind of uh, information that we can get once we started to see a lot of this data in the system. You can also look at the, 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 gear, the vessel type and look at the diversity of the gear type. And then, of course, we have to do more research and understand the, you know, how those gears interact and the impact on the environment and et cetera. But those are the kind of things that we can look at with this data set. And, 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 and in relation also to the catches, if you want, or these, in this particular instance with that human development index. This is another one of those maps that you can also do. You started to look at the kind of issues that small-scale fisheries face. Basically, the circle suggests the amount, the number of issues that each location faces. So, you know, once we finish the map with all those countries, they would, the map would be full of bubbles. 
But basically, it does show right, that the kind of complexity and the challenges that these small-scale fisheries face in trying to maintain the livelihoods and for sustainable fisheries. So those issues are those issues that I have already presented, including many others that, that each location actually faces. Okay, so research innovation is also required. So what to do? What, what are the concerns? I mean, with all those concerns that we have, what kind of research we have to do to address them? So there are many, many different issues that we can address, and we start adding more of them too as we go into this journey. We started from looking at viability, looking at well-being, and now we have to look at market. Now we have to look at transboundary issues. We have to expand into inland. We have to look at indigenous. There's a lot of things that we are trying to do and we definitely wanted to, we're not going to be able to do them all in the project lifetime, but we would like to continue to do this again with the help of, of as many people as possible. I just want to put some attention to one particular research that we do that I believe that has a lot of innovation and that is the research we do on governance. And the reason for that is just imagine I mean, this is the first time, really, that we have this big volume of research on small-scale fisheries governance, 34 case, case studies from 34 countries in the same volume. That's a large-scale study. And the importance of that is that all those case studies use the same theoretical framework, which is the interactive governance. So how do they do that? Well, we we twisted their arms, right? We said, look, think about it. We want to really understand what's going on. We need to be able to make those comparisons. We need to learn. Everybody was going about their study using their own lens and own, own perspective, but they also embraced this interactive governance framework. I'll show you what it is a little bit. It's quite, I said this yesterday, and people said that I probably should have some, some slide to show what I meant. But it, it's a pretty simple framework. It's a very systematic way of going about understanding fisheries. So on the top part of this slide, it's recognized that it's about fish chain. So we have the aquatic system, we have the harvest, and we have the post-harvest. Governance takes place along that chain and there's a lot of feedback going as well throughout. So it's not about governing the fishing sector, but also the post-harvest and also this uh, pre-harvest as well. But how to do that when the system is so complex and there's a lot of diversity and there might be some dynamic in the system? This is not about shying away from any of that. This is about really put attention to understand those characteristics. So the system that we are trying to govern both include, include both the natural system and the social system. So diversity, complexity, dynamic, and scale occur in both systems. We need to understand them. And you can say the same with the governing system, because there's also some government have a lot of departments and a lot of different uh, um, authorities in charge of those fisheries. Sometimes they have these overlapping jurisdiction and boundaries. If you scaled it up in terms of um, jurisdiction, you get a lot more complex uh, situation that we need to deal with. So what they do is they create what we call governability challenges. So we use the term governability to help us guide our way into analyzing how are we going to govern these fisheries, to what extent we can do to understand what aspect of these fisheries that require a lot more attention from the governing perspective in order to, to do well in supporting these uh, small-scale fishing people. One thing is about the characteristics of the system itself. When the system is very complex, you would imagine that it actually would be more difficult to govern. But if you have a very competent governing authority, you might actually do a good job. So those kind of relationships and how these two governing systems and the system to be governed match depends, you know, would give rise to that governability. So there's a few of those kind of analytical lens that we put into understanding systematically what's happening in the fisheries so that we can really think about what would be some of those way forward if you're trying to improve governance. The 34 countries have, uh, of the case studies actually are global in terms of this, the, the coverage and also include uh, countries in the north as much as in, well, in few countries in the north, a lot in the south. 
but we would like to be able to do, do more of these studies in other places as well, in maybe in another book. What do we learn from those studies? So, to enhance governability, first thing we recognize is that the governance actually needs to be sensitive to the needs of the small-scale fishing people and so responsive to their situation. Small-scale fisheries would benefit from more constructive interaction and collective action, empowerment and innovation. But because they're so diverse, we can't really have one blueprint that would work for all of them. So we really need to recognize that. But perhaps that's not new. What is really new is about the way the P how we structure the governing system at this time to really look at, uh, to, to, to govern the sector. It turns out that the choice of what governing mode to choose, to use, is quite important. Is this going to be a hierarchical of governance, a top-down approach, or is this going to be a bottom-up self-governance system, or actually a co-management? What we see a lot in these different examples around the world that we study in this volume is actually there's a lot of transition. So there's a lot of interest in moving into this kind of hybrid system of governance. So that would be an exciting thing to see whether that is really going to produce uh, the outcome that we'd like to see or not. After doing research, we also have to do training and we have to build capacity and now we introduce something that a little bit different from what we talked about yesterday in terms of interdisciplinarity. This is a transdisciplinary fisheries course. So again, you know, there is a dilemma just like what we try to do in, in interdisciplinary. We might go to a conference that is basically that we organized in the World Fisheries Congress, and then we have some um, national scientists participating in there, and they really enjoy the conference. And then we have social scientists in that conference and wondering, well, what are the things they're doing here anyway? But being transdisciplinary, that means we actually include fishing people in the conference, and we don't really blame them for saying those things. So the conference actually had to put in, you know, if you think conference is a way to provide platform for interaction and dialogue, then you have to make it fun, then you have to make it work for everyone, and then through that process, when it transdisciplinary for us, is actually when we engage with people, you know, different knowledge holders, including fish harvesters in this case. So we're actually trying to bring their knowledge into formulating what we need to do when we develop this transdisciplinary fisheries course. And I really don't think we have the solution yet, but you can imagine that it's a problem-driven, it's an issue-based process that we are taking to learn about transdisciplinary. So there will be a lot of topics that are quite specific to certain um, disciplinary uh, uh, discourse, but at the same time, there'll be a lot of those that are shared between some of those disciplines. So we started to you know, look into some of those topics that have to be looked at from various perspectives, whereas some of those topics might be more at the core of a certain disciplines. So those are the kind of things that we would include in this transdisciplinary fisheries course, which is going to be an online open access again which is the policy, uh, you know, that, that's how we, our philosophy in working with Too Big To Ignore, everything is basically opened and everybody can use it. So I'm going to go to governance, and this is, I just wanted to note um, here about how governance refer to mechanisms, processes, and institutions through which public and private sectors articulate their interests, exercise their rights, meet their obligations, and mediate their differences in order to make decision affecting the society. So just keep those keywords in mind, articulate interest, exercise rights, meet obligation, and mediate the difference. That's what you do if you really are interested in looking at governance. A project that we did, this is what the project that Professor Sven Yentov is in the audience here with his colleague and a group of people did to look at poverty in small scale fisheries. Through those case studies, we learned that uh, you can sort of like look at uh, 
small scale fishing people along the poverty line, if you like, the level of poverty. And you see that the majority of the people are in the group in the middle there, that they're poor, but they actually are sufficient and actually quite enjoy that livelihoods that they have. And they may be moving a little bit on, you know, being really improved their wealth and well-being, but there's a lot of, there's a, 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 also a good proportion of the population there that actually are very poor. And they are the group that are in that kind of like a slippery slope in terms of they actually, you know, the, the, the people in the middle can actually slide, slide down to become much poorer because of the kind of policies and governance uh, decisions that we make that make things worse for them. Whereas a lot of time decisions are making to help people move into the other direction. Now, that's governance in the context of poverty. What about governance in the context of sustainability? So you can imagine that this is, I believe, a curve that you probably you would all be familiar with. But you think about this, right? Because when you started to see that you, you, you find yourself in a situation where you're on this, uh, you know, this uh, left-hand side, is that left, right-hand side of the curve? I don't know which one left. So basically, you can imagine that, no, you're right. You can imagine that people <laughs> In that situation, find himself thinking that, well, we are overfishing. And then the first thing you do is trying to say, well, let's, uh, you know, there are too many people chasing too few fish. And then you started to get rid of them. And the first group of the people are the one that I showed you before. These are the poor people, the ones that are really vulnerable and already marginalized. They're the first to go. So there's something wrong with that kind of thinking. So if we are really interested in moving into um, you know, the, 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 the place that we like to see, we would need to do something different. And that is about thinking about governance in a different way. For instance, there is a concept, a principle, the difference principle, basically, which is about preferential treatment. So if people have been marginalized and they have a lot of conditions that really not in, at their fault, sometimes it's because of the policy and intervention that create that condition that make it impossible for them to have their livelihoods. We need to correct that. So they have to be treated uh, better and with the preference. And that's what happened with South Africa and Cambodia. Subsidiarity is in the constitution, in the EU constitution, but it could also apply to the scale, meaning that if fishing can be taken at the smallest scale, why don't we do it that way? Why do we need to go into the larger scale? And then, of course, not to think about applying the economic efficiency principle, but also think about principles like sufficiency, which is what the fishing people tell us. I leave it there. So give some time for questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks very much. We, we do have a, a little time for questions, despite the technical gremlins, which <laughs> Ratan have managed to survive. So a, a, any questions, please? Let's start over, over here. Couple in front. Okay, I can. Uh, is, uh, are the gremlins going to work here as well? No. Thank you very much for a very interesting and inspiring talk. Um, I was very interested in climate change issues, and if you look at the IPCC reports, they tend to be dominated by the global north and by large scale fisheries. I was wondering if you could comment on your understanding of how climate change will affect both the global south and particularly small-scale fisheries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that is actually a new research cluster that we added since uh, the Merida Congress last year to recognize that issue. So we have a cluster now that look at what we call global response. Um, which is a lot to do with how small-scale fishing people cope and adapt to those uh, changes, whether it's environmental changes or other kind of climate-related, as well as you know, market and other governance changes. So we do have uh, a couple of researchers right now doing research on... I have a student that's working in Ghana, for instance, and looking at that issue. 
I myself um, from Thailand, and we have a lot of um, you know situation in the south of Thailand and also in that part of the world that definitely are uh, about how small scale coastal and fishing communities are being um, affected by this kind of change. But it's, it's, it's really, in our research, it's really a lot to do with understanding how they, how they respond to those kind of changes and the kind of mechanisms and the process then that we, uh, from the government perspective and also from the research community, can support. And I think a lot of time what we find, I mean, in those places that we do research when we're trying to understand the vulnerability of the small-scale fishing people, like I said, it's a lot to do with how they're not being paid attention to in terms of their needs and their demands and the kind of conditions that they face. I mean, it's a lot of work that we need to do, but we learned good lessons from around the world already in terms of you know, the indigenous communities in the north that, that are also affected, as well as those uh, you know, communities in, in, in the small islands and also in, in, in places like Bangladesh, which one of my students is working with as well. So it's, it's hard to know at this time uh, how we would get enough information or understanding about their conditions we, we can't say that we would be able to find out all those information, but with this research cluster, we hope that we would learn as much as we can about the lessons and the uh, kind of uh, uh, responses that uh, the fishing people make in order to help as part of the learning for other communities that might face the same situation. So our hope would be to use those lessons and share those lessons in a way that can help others adapt and cope with their situation. Thank you seen at least three other people with questions. I'm not sure we'll get to everybody, but I think the next one was down here. Hi, I'm Nathalie Steins from Imaris. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, it seems to me that a lot of, lot of messages that you uh, uh, presented are also applicable to the large-scale fisheries. And what always strikes me is that a lot of the natural scientists involved in fisheries seem to be focusing a lot on the larger scale fisheries and that the social scientists have this bias to focus on small scale fisheries. And yesterday in the uh, SICOM open session on integrating the human dimension, we talked a lot about crossing borders between natural mm -hmm. scientists and mm -hmm. social scientists. But to me, it seems that there's also be a lot of border crossing needed between social scientists working in fisheries because there's a lot of interactions between um, small scale fisheries and large scale fisheries in the governance uh, system. Mm -hmm. And yet, a lot of social scientists are not focusing on these large fisheries at all. So I was wondering what your views about this are and what we should do. Mm -hmm. um I'm not sure if I would agree with not social science not doing research on large-scale fisheries. I think there are a lot of social science uh, research that have been done on large-scale fisheries. Um, and in fact, I think that's where we have been doing. We have, we have been putting a lot of attention on large-scale fisheries in all aspects of large-scale fisheries. You know, look, look for instance at the people that study the organizations, the industry, the allocation systems, the rights and access in the large scale fisheries context, right? So, you know, what, what attracts people to do research that we are doing here is it's, it's the issues based, right? It's driven by those problems. And if problems arise in whatever sector, that's what we're interested in. What I think, but I agree with you that a lot more of this cross fertilization and also cross border, as you suggested, would be definitely important. We'd love to get more natural scientists, for instance, taking a look at, you know, and there are already some natural scientists as well that look at small scale fisheries and trying to understand, you know, the, the population, the life history and the assessment of that sector. But yes, more, more would be uh, very good to do. Okay, I'm conscious that we're moving into coffee time, but with your in indulgence, because we did lose a little bit of time with technical problems, I saw one question down here and goes one up there. So if we take the one down here. Thanks for your very interesting talk. And already the, the last two questions, and you have mentioned uh, throughout the talk the conflict between large scale fisheries and small scale fisheries. But taking into account the, the increasing 
importance of aquaculture production, how do you think this going, is going to affect small-scale fisheries in the future? Mm -hmm. And by aquaculture production, you mean large-scale. <laughs> okay. You see, this is interesting, right? Because in the small-scale fisheries, we also look at small-scale aquaculture, almost like the small-scale farming, which also take place, and those are really important as part of food security as well. So we have people that, that do small-scale uh, fish farming. Um, I... First of all, I actually don't think, you know, I, I know there's tension between sector, small scale and large scale, and, you know, maybe somebody's wondering now too, am I actually promoting that we get rid of all the large scale fisheries? And I don't really say that, I know, I'm not yet anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but, but the point is though that people like to use this argument, right, for food security when they talk about aquaculture production, you know, because if, if, if capture fisheries, we have problem, large scale, then why don't we do aquaculture large scale so that we can provide food, right, to people. But I would question, however, what's going on in that aquaculture sector, as many of us know, in terms of, you know, the competition, you want to talk about conflict, it's the use of feed, right, that, that is used in the aquaculture sector, and also who you feed the fish to at the end of the day, when you said food security, who's being fed with the food that is being produced in aquaculture. It's not really the people that are impoverished for the most part. And last question. Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, most of the time, small-scale fisheries research, um, it's taking place in a much smaller scale, right? The, our effort here with Too Big to Ignore is to make that more global, basically trying to do as, as much as we can to learn and connect and make sure that, you know, those kind of boundary issues and the scale issues is actually addressed in, in, in our research. But it's not that easy to do. We, we, we like to put a lot of emphasis, right, in the, lo in the location, just because that system within the location is the first point that we need to understand, recognizing, of course, that pressure and drivers and other, you know, external forces would affect that system. So, you know, you kind of have to do the same thing that you're trying to do, I think, in a natural system, which is to make that connection and extend that to the extent possible. There is no global governance in fisheries, right, in many ways. But the guidelines, the small-scale fisheries guidelines that we now have, is going to be that instrument, I think, that could help make that connection much better. Climate change is in the paragraph, in the guidelines, as one of the things that, that we need to look at. So, you know, r recognizing the issue with migration, for sure. Re and, and there are some people, right, even small-scale fishing people that migrate from coast to coast as well, not even migrating because they have to move from a certain area alone. So the more we do this kind of research, I think, the more we will be able to make those connections. And like I said, with that kind of umbrella uh, guidelines that we have with FAO, I think we will be able to do a much better job at putting the knowledge together and started to see the big picture. It, it's difficult to do, but I think TBTI is, is really promoting that kind of connection and the system understanding as much as we can. But like I said, we do need a lot of uh, help 
and a lot of support from everybody. So, um, you know, join us and therefore, you know, this will be an opportunity actually for the natural science scientists and the social scientists to work together to address the issue that I believe is a global concern. Thank you. Okay, so I'm afraid we'll have to draw this to a close. Um, before we finish, on, on behalf of ICES, there's a small gift for the speaker here. Thank you. So, 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 yeah, just like to thank Ratna again for an excellent talk and I'll let you go to coffee. Thank you very much.